Hello, I'm John Beethan with AlternativeHealthTools.com, the podcast where together we discover alternative health tools and resources from practitioners and experts. This is episode 48, and it's titled Choosing Love with Rebecca Freedom. It's subtitled Love Has a Learning Curve, and We Need to Have a Little Mercy for Ourselves. This is also the final in what has become a three part series with Rebecca on addiction, breakup rehab, and now choosing love. Really, these three episodes are more like an audio webinar given by Rebecca. And if you haven't listened to the first two episodes, at any time, you can find them on alternativehealthtools.com under the menu option, Episode Listings, or simply enter in the search box, Addiction or Breakup or Rebecca Freedom, spelled R-E-B-E-K-A-H. And like all three episodes with Rebecca, the show notes on the website contain the rich list of quotes, books, and resource links she mentions on each show. And to make it so easy for you to get the next show we release, simply go to your favorite app store, search for Alternative Health Tools, and download the app. It's free, and you'll automatically get new episodes when they're released. So now together, let's do this. Choosing Love with Rebecca Freedom. You're coming together because you know that uh, where two or more are gathered together, the spirit of the Lord is there, that that creative force is there, and and it augments both parties' purpose, right? But the conscious thing was like to be radically honest and to understand that within the boundary of that relationship, both people will expand into more than they were in their individual space. Hi, everybody. Let's just jump into making this relevant to you because uh, I am aware that there are so many coaches and um, specialists out in the world that are really, you know, hawking their wares. So the reason for, for this particular subject of choosing love is because it's so all-encompassing. It encompasses your desires for romantic relationship and for partnership and, uh, and how to, how to have that, or if you're in it, how to have it be a healthy relationship that's really sustaining your desires. The other reason for the topic of choosing love is because there's so much fear in the world. Mm. Right. And I, I just, Even as I say that, I encourage everybody who's listening to just kind of notice the ways that they're holding fear, right? The Mm -hmm. different places in their life, whether it's in their finances or in family traditions, and uh, they feel fearful of God or spirituality, uh, and and fear often shows up as anger in our lives. Mm. So... We'll dive in really into the multifaceted and multi-layered subject of choosing love with hopefully the successful outcome at the end of this podcast being a real sense of like personal empowerment and clarity and above all else, just that sense of like relief, like, Mm -hmm. oh, okay, I get it. I get it. And you do check in throughout the show, I noticed, mm-hmm. with people. So. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's let's start out of the gate. The horse is in the gate, guns going off. So the first the first <laughs> the first lap is really asking the question, what is choice? Right? Mm-hmm. And the second question, of course, is gonna be like, well, what is love? And so choosing as it's come into my awareness is choice is the God force within. Great. That's a very fancy bumper sticker, (laughs) (laughs) you know, hashtag. Uh, But what that means is that if we're made in the image and likeness of, 
God or we have, we're endowed with the ability to create or to destroy, then the rudder, the thing that steers are the, the energy that we are into creation or destruction is choice. Hmm. <laughs> I just I just get the chills when I feel that. So, so think about there's all the different small incremental choices we make through the day, mm-hmm. right? Like we wake up every single day and we choose the job that we go to, mm-hmm. right? We choose it that day. And well, some people would, would argue with you on that one, but yeah, you're saying if you're conscious about, well, you can be, you can be super unconscious about it. You can be motivated by baser um, instincts. So I really thank you for asking that. I really want to be clear that not all choice is conscious choice. It's not all like in the realm of um, awareness, right? It's not in uh, the realm of the ego that's like, I can see it, taste it, touch it, make it tangible. Much of our choices are instinctual. Mm -hmm. They're instinct based. And the reason that those automatic choices exist is for one purpose only. And that's to keep the body alive, right? Yeah. So it's funny because I have, as I say these things, I have all these like lyrics in the back of my head that like come through. Uh, the bodies hit the floor and just kind of came to mind. It's like one of those like <laughs> kind of songs that uh, is a rage type song. And in some ways, our instincts are like that. They're just, they're so... Uh, like primal and basic. They're basic. They're just here to keep your biology going. So we have automatic and instinctual choices that are happening. Now there's more conscious choices because I guarantee with our low attention span in America that people are at this point in the podcast being like, oh, I could go do something else. (laughs) <laughs> let me go to my social media. Let me like go eat something. Let me bleh, go drink or let me do something else, right? Like I'm bored already. So I need to keep the stimuli up, 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 up. Um, and what I learned about that is uh, that dopamine, this lovely neurotransmitter in our brains, regulates those impulsive feelings, right? So if we eat and we feel good enough, there's enough dopamine that goes, okay, you're good. There's some people that don't have that, they have lower receptors. So there's like always this impulsivity for the next thing, for the next thing, for the next thing, for the next thing. And the thing that moves you from instinctual to intentional is the harnessing of the power of your mind. Boom! <laughs> Bing! Public service announcement. Your mind doesn't exist, nor can be measured, but it's one of the most powerful things on earth, endowed to you and everybody else. You're not special because you have a mind, but you are indeed powerful. Bing! <laughs> so, mind, the mind. Uh, By the way, yeah. I, I, you know, I didn't leave the room. I'm here and I get it. <laughs> it's just this really lovely setup because as you and I sort of come together, I can just feel this alchemy yeah. of yeah. Uh, John does such a good job of like holding space. Mm-hmm. Right. And thank you. yeah, there's just this like this really beautiful container that happens. And, and this is sort of the, one of the, spiritual elements of the mind where you can just, there's something that forms that's just with beyond words and the harnessing of the mind is where choice is really intentional choice is really born, right? I can choose a or B or find the middle way, the Tao. And in doing so, uh, I'm going to, experiment with my creative powers because oftentimes best laid intentions don't result in the outcome you wanted right 
and I can use an example from my life. I'm <clears throat> very much a person that when I feel something, when I'm just, I've got that like, that that river of emotion just like rushing through me. I uh, The best way that I can sum it up is a sentence that came out of the book of the wisdom of the Enneagram. And it said, as sort of an eight personality type, my uh, the phrase that would best describe me is, I'm here, deal with me. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I've arrived, I'm now your issue. Let's do this. And because there's a a bit of a confrontational engagement. So um, so that's a choice point that comes to there on how I navigate those waters, right? And oftentimes I tried, I, I I get really loquacious and want to have like these like deep, intense conversations immediately. I don't care about the timing if it has to happen. No. And, and, uh, for all of you who are out there drunk texting your exes, you know, you get what I'm saying. (laughs) I'm on to you. (laughs) (laughs) So, so choice. So let's just really kind of wrap it up. Choices. It's when you move out of the instinctual um, into the intentional, and that is how it becomes a, your, the way you direct your life. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to pursue this uh, area of education versus I'm going to go shoot heroin in an alley. You know, yeah. like both are going to create some version of an outcome, but generally we see that shooting heroin is a path of destruction. Right. You know, and back to um, talking about our addiction cycle, because what I see in people that choose that path is they're chasing the dragon. They're chasing a high. They're chasing their, the void actually turns into the hungry ghost with a pinhole for a mouth and the grand Canyon for a stomach. There can never be satiation but only the um, the the life being robbed from you, right? Versus an intentional life, where there's this constant building upon the things you're learning, and there's this ever unfolding piece of discovering your essential self feels very different. It feels so good. (laughs) So the thing I said, and this is going to really bridge us from choice into choosing love, is there's a statement circulating the the internet and out in the world right now that loneliness is not the feeling of missing another person. Loneliness is not the feeling of missing another person or thing. It's that we're really missing ourselves. I read that. I know. Like, and, uh, and I just want to tell everybody from this point in the podcast on buckle up because my Pentecostal roots are about to come through. So get some who's and ha's. It's going to be like James Brown showed up in this room. (laughs) (laughs) Can you feel it? My arms are in the air. Put your arms up. It's more fun that way. So, woo! So, so choosing love, love, and as I mentioned it in the beginning, uh, is always present and fear is the fallacy that you are separate from love, right? And, and again, the book that really best takes us through the journey of understanding separation, understanding fear and understanding the energy of love is A Course in Miracles. That's, that's the book that I would really recommend everybody start to sort of piece through um, if you're ready to receive that level of impactful awareness. If you want to be ignorant and blissful, by all means, too. <laughs> yeah, we all have those moments. It's called champagne. <laughs> <laughs> and there's also there's also this thing called timing, too. Yes, yes. Because you had said that you had first become aware of the Course of Miracles like a long time ago. Yeah. But it's just like, what's this? Not, yeah. Not for me. No, yeah, where you're just like, meh. But then a, a series of events happens that opens you up to yeah. being able to receive that particular thing. 
<clears throat> high broken hearted person listening to this podcast. I get you. And we're going to really uh, talk about why and how choosing love is going to be the fundamental aspect of turning your life around. And, um, and it doesn't have to be broken hearted from the uh, absence of romance in your life. Mm -hmm. It can be uh, broken hearted because a settling into a job that you know is not the right fit is happening. It can be broken hearted because you didn't have the childhood that you're comparing to everybody else's childhood. So you feel like you didn't have the childhood you should have had and carrying that broken heart around. And I just recently had a conversation with a dear friend who's been carrying the story around that she's a disappointment mm. and therefore the relationships that have manifested in her life had reflected back the, the spirit of disappointing. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I really want to come down to say that, that choosing love is, it's the thing that lifts us up. It's the thing that makes the biggest difference. And, and the next question, of course, would be, well, how do you do that? Right. Can I point out something? Mm -hmm. In every case that you have mentioned, mm -hmm. those people mm -hmm. that you sort of used as examples, we all have a tendency to do this to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in the case of, you know, I didn't have the childhood that I wanted to have. Yeah, you're reliving that one over and over and over mm -hmm. without choice. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it goes into the realm of the instinctual, where you just mm -hmm. you just keep replicating it, mm -hmm. and with without any uh, until it gets so uncomfortable, right? Painful. Yeah, painful. Where the the scream is so loud in your body and in your life um, that you can't do heroin anymore, mm -hmm. and you have to make a different choice and to shift that addiction mm -hmm. into awareness. And I would say that there's something benevolent and merciful about all the first, second, third, and infinite tries we get <laughs> <laughs> while in human form. And um, I'll say as a medium, as a psychic too, even after, <laughs> you still, you get do-overs some people might know it as uh, reincarnation. <laughs> Anybody? Anyone familiar? I mean, all of us are walking around being like, oh my God, your karma is so bad. <laughs> so that must be karma. Okay, so let's heal some broken hearts then. Let's go there. So one of the things that... I had insight about after sitting down last night and journaling, I, I came home from my job at um, the rehab I work at and I felt really heavy and I felt like those moments where you come home to, uh, to spaciousness, I, I fortunately live by myself. I'm not, um, you know, having to deal with roommates per se, landlords, but not roommates. And so there's times when it's a blessing, but last night it felt really dense, felt mm -hmm. really like heavy, like, oh, there's no one to meet me in this space, right? Like I don't, like here I am having spent the day's energy in trying to elevate, educate, mirror, and shift uh, perception for um, uh, people outside of myself. Right. And, and that's the job of a counselor. It's a very privileged seat. And I'll go on record as saying at times it's exhausting. Yeah. It's easy to imagine mm -hmm. at times. And I think that there's, a, there's even something quietly, uh, that proliferates the, the industry where you almost like can't say that you can almost can't reveal your humanness. Like, just um, like with clergy or something uh, like that we have this infinite godlike structure and I'm I'm gonna go on record being like not me said the bee not I said the fly and uh, so I came home to this heaviness last night where I was like oh, I just wish there was a dude here <laughs> like and not anybody but a, a conscious partner so I want to kind of 
give voice to two different sort of ways relationships are happening in the world right now. There's transactional relationships that mm. are happening, which are very much of like the physical plane, like just mm. give my body pleasure, right? We'll just hook up with each other. And, uh, and that serves its purpose. There's, there's a time and space for that. And we'll just hold that at one end of the spectrum, transactional relationships of like, you're responsible for my emotions. Um, there's a, there's a little of a parental aspect to it. You know, the person can't regulate their own feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. They need something externally from them Mm -hmm. to elicit those. The other end of the spectrum, and I uh, came across just a really beautiful description of this uh, on Facebook, and we'll provide the link to it because it was just so perfect, was what this person described as conscious relationships. And I don't really want to get the whole Gwyneth Paltrow conscious uncoupling thing on board. I know that the author of uh, Calling in the One is responsible for that particular nomenclature. And... Um, it's a good vehicle to help people describe their ultra spiritual way of breaking up, <laughs> you know, like, woo, we did it on purpose because whatever. But the, uh, the particular person that I read said, here's the deal about conscious relationships is you're coming together because you know that, uh, where two or more are gathered together, the spirit of the Lord is there, that that creative force is there, and and it augments both parties' purpose, right? And this is something that has been described as twin flame sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Again, it, don't get stuck on these descriptions, because I've, I've been that person that's been on Google and been like, oh my God, this is totally what's happening right now. I lost my twin flame. I don't even get it. So what the snit? <clears throat> if you're that person, just know I've been there. It's cool, man. <laughs> we all have to go through our iterations of being. But the conscious thing was like to be radically honest and to understand that within the boundary of that relationship, both people will expand into more than they were in their individual space. Bingo. No, that's that's a big one. Like, whew, how big? How like to say that you have a you have the beginning of the village there with you because that sort of energy uh, magnetizes community. And again, we could do a whole other conversation about this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> coming up, (laughs) but not in this very second. In this second, specific to choosing love versus transactional relationship. Transactional relationship is seated in fear. I have to be this way, make myself smaller, diminish my, my light because I might lose this person. I might lose this uh, catalyst to a particular feeling. They might go out of my life. I can't really handle rejection. I can't, I don't have the capacity to survive without somebody else, right? And again, this falls in the realm of instinctual. Um, mm-hmm. there, it's, it's very true. Like we need to do certain things to keep our bodies alive. And, and that transactional space is just uh, a step on the path. It's a a rung of the ladder. Back on the other side, the conscious relationship is where when you choose love, you don't hold someone hostage to being the thing that makes you feel a certain way. I'm going to say that again. When you choose love, you don't hold another person hostage to being the thing that makes you feel uplifted, joyful, peaceful, and utmost secure. Can you feel that? Feel that energy of like everybody out there with a broken heart, just so desperately like battling with their desire for security. I just want to feel secure. I want to feel safe. I want to feel, and I want to say the word when a woman says to a man, you make me feel safe. It's this emboldened energy of the masculine rising up and saying, oh, here's my purpose. I'm here to protect the feminine flower. But I want to tell you the feminine flower is a thousand uh, lotus petal flower. And we have these 
immense energy of nurturing and creativity and light and love that is being shown into the world. And that is something that is not specific to the sex that you were born or to your your gender. That feminine energy of nurturing is inside of all of us. And it's recognizing that I don't have to hold you to a particular standard to make myself feel better. Can I get an amen? on? <laughs> so conscious relationship is your clue that you're choosing love. It's your clue that you're, you're like, oh, I am so in love with finance or, or this level of creation. Um, dog rescue is something I just came across where Michael, I watched a, a video about Michael Vick's dogs, how he was running a dog fighting ring. And he's um, right. now a, a football player who got reinstated with the Eagles is making a hundred million dollars, but he ran, he ran something that would be like the ostuates for, for pit bulls. Yep. Disgusting. Really disgusting. But what happened is that the force called love entered into that place and people with hearts of compassion didn't just go in and destroy the dogs. They said these dogs can be rehabilitated. So they went to a place that was called like best friends and um, and they were fearful and they would do something called pancaking, just lay on the ground and just not want to be moved. And they hated doorways because a doorway meant they were going to fight. And that's how they were entrained. And what happened is as these people came in and surrounded these dogs with the ability to be re- rehabilitated, they showed that this particular breed is not a vicious breed and they can be loving companions. And so that completely shifted the idea of breed selection and it showed that that a person who is living in fear and an animal and entity and energy that is living in fear can actually move from fear into a place of love and what better dem- to demonstrate that than dogs right right because they're all around us we have, mm-hmm. if we don't have one we know somebody that does yes yeah and i think and someone said it to me like dogs innately are love mm-hmm Right, they just they just wag their tails and they're mm-hmm. slobbery and and they're just these these little beings of companionship. Mm-hmm. My my sister is a dog trainer, mm-hmm. and I have seen her walk up to or be somewhere, and a dog will start like barking, mm-hmm. and she just goes, "Oh, really?" <laughs> and the dog just melts. Oh, that's yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's not me, is it? And we can be like dogs that bark. We're like, I have a voice. I have a voice. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Now, now, now. Post on social media, awkward things for people to read, enter into passive aggressiveness. Ruff, 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 ruff. <laughs> Human version of barking. <laughs> so I bring, I bring that up because sometimes conscious relationship happens through our companions with, with pets, you know? Mm. Uh, that can be like the first place where we just show up ourselves, right? We don't. And uh, if you are a, a cat person, I think cats really can challenge that because they're like, love me, pet me, don't touch me. I told you now, feed me. Blech. <laughs> fickle. They're fickle little creatures um, until they're not, you know, and, until they want to curl up and then dig the claws into you and, <laughs> and purr and all that kind of stuff. So I want to offer in this conversation that animals are really uh, both domestic and exotic are some of our greatest teachers about choosing love. Mm-hmm. No, I get, I get that totally. That's been my experience mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. my, with you know, my dog Maggie, mm-hmm. half Malamute, half Coyote, and she was awesome. Mm-hmm. Inside, love. Mm-hmm. Outside. A lot of fun, mm-hmm. curious, mm-hmm. and that balance was just wonderful. She taught me how to have fun and mm-hmm. how to be loving, mm-hmm. and to move outside of the the uh, the narcissistic narcissistic wound that we can sort of like develop, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, I want to speak to the spiritual aspect of this, where sometimes right. the beginning aspect of of figuring of touching into self tends to be what people would call Mm self-centered, right? Versus like self-aware. And uh, I had a friend who would say, you have to be selfish for yourself. 
hmm. at, at times. So specific to that, moving in between these sort of realms of transactional to con to intentional to conscious relationship and mm -hmm. to relating and with the overarching uh, bell curve of choosing, you know, fear on one side and choosing love on another side um, is that it, it takes, it takes time and it takes practice and, and animals give us a good opportunity to, to, to practice, whether you're doing conservation efforts and for everybody out, out there who is truly, you know, boots on the ground, working to save tigers, working to, uh, to sustain our rainforests and to, to care for the organism that we live on mother earth. I just want to give my greatest thank you for that, you know, for that being the thing that you're devoting your life to. So, <clears throat> and, uh, and I would say that's something that moves inside of me. And the reason that I am having these conversations or doing these podcasts is because I realize that when we choose love, it opens our eyes to what heaven on earth really looks like. So what Oprah might say it looks like is, you know, there's a lot of charity, but there's a lot of materialism mm -hmm. that's happening as well. And I recently watched a blog this morning of Erin uh, Janice. She's a, she's mm -hmm. a ve vegan advocate. She's got a um, YouTube channel and, uh, she's, you can, she's passionate about this and she was like, no one needs a mansion. Hmm. Really? And I want to, I want to parse that apart a little bit to say that, um, that someone's art form might be creating that mansion and the elaborate structure in it, like the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. sure. um, like the palace in Versailles or, the uh, the amber room that the Nazis like built and then got uh, demolished and then redone is something that we that is is the uh, acquiring of resources and turning into something really beautiful, right? And is it necessary? Right? Is it kind? <laughs> Does it? What is the contribution of that? And. Uh, all very good questions. Yeah, yeah. Especially given the area where we live in, in this part of the country. Mm -hmm. And we're rich. We're really, if you live in America, even at the lowest, you're still there. And mm -hmm. so so without veering too far into it, um, what I am getting at is, let's say you're single and you're sad and you wish you had a mate, and you think, oh, this will make my life better. If I could only have a partner. If. Yeah. Very dangerous. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Just load the gun and play Russian roulette with the word if. <laughs> um, if I only, then I could. If I only, then I could. If I only, then I could. So what I want to say about that is purpose. Finding that thing that moves you beyond the instinctual space into the intentional space, into the space of collection of community. And what I realized last night as I was sitting in my home alone with that density of feeling that what I was longing for was quality connection over quantity. And that as I got online to look at pictures on social media or, or post whatever I thought was intriguing, that that was an, a bombardment of quantity, of quantity. And, and the insidious feeling of comparison started to rise up in me. Oh, I'm not, I'm not saving the whales, you know? Oh, I'm going to Whole Foods and paying 40 bucks for three items, most of them wrapped in plastic, you know, like this, this sense of like incompetency, right? I'm just failing, failing at life, I'm failing. I can't 
get where I want to be. And then I remembered <laughs> this thing called purpose that, that somehow grabs the structure that is your body, right? And I want to say that if you were born in whatever ethnicity, black, white, yellow, red, uh, whatever, whatever sex, male or female or gender, or transgender, or wherever you're at, that there's a particular alchemy and purpose to the way that your being has shown up in this world. And, it, and there's something called purpose trying to move through that. And that purpose is to, if nothing else, if you cannot show people who you really are, then stand in the place of witnessing and giving other per- person witness and reflection to how you see them, but from a place of love and compassion saying, you're afraid and I'm afraid. We are in the this together. We're in this together and together we're going to create this movement and momentum that takes us from the dark place of believing the instinct is the only place that I can live in. An instinct will always produce more fear, the desire to escape, a <clears throat> a total uh, obsession and fixation with the monetary gain or the material world, and then blinds you to the realization that you are a spirit in a body. Your body is not the dominant vehicle of your existence, but rather is just a container for this thing called spirit to be born into the world in a way that has you choosing love and living your purpose. I told you I'd get Pentecostal. <laughs> I think we're done. <laughs> but I'm sure there's more. I'm going to break it down. I'm going to break it down. <laughs> James Brown, break it down. <laughs> get on up. Uh, All right. So, per per use, yeah. let's take a moment to just, I want to say, beautiful people out there who are listening right? There can be the sense of pressure in finding your purpose. So I want to break it down to really, really super fundamental elements of what that is. So first of all, it's the recognition that you are not an accident, not an accident. And there's several people whose mothers and fathers did not want them, you know, uh, that their birth was an inconvenience or on the other end of the spectrum, there's several mothers and fathers who are completely enthralled with having a mini me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> none of that's an accident and, uh, start there, start there, start with, um, the, the traumas and the pains and the joys and, uh, all the different sort of elements that have been part of your unfolding were not an accident. Now, I don't know if it was you or someone else mm. who said, we can, we can think anything. We can think anything. We can have the most licentious, like nefarious, like dark thoughts and it's not the thoughts per se, but rather what you do with them that produces enlightenment. I said something similar, yes. Well, clearly it was genius. Yes. <laughs> Obviously. Oh. Einstein, is, exactly Einstein, is that you? <laughs> so, okay. So, right. So, okay. Uh you know, just to be with that sense of you're going to feel a lot of different things and you're going to feel a lot of different things. And, and the next thing is like, okay, it's not an accident that this particular emotion is coming up in this, in this time. It's my body. I'm being signaled. Um, but a lot of time we don't know how to make meaning out of it. Right. So we just judge it. Right. Oh, that goes in the wrong category. This goes in the right category. And, 
I guess that's what I would like to say about the subject in this moment, where we, a lot of people could esteem choosing love as like, oh, that's the right thing, right? But what's not wrong about fear? Hmm. What's not wrong about like sitting in the petu- pest- bleh, petulance and <laughs> disgust and you know sorrow and 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 just you know having those be a part of the experience, right? Black is a beautiful color. <laughs> So what's not wrong about fear and what's right about love, you know, you can run those and to say that if you're like, okay, this feeling is an accident, I can, I, I can have the maturity to feel my feelings and, uh, and move beyond making meaning that they're right or wrong, good or bad. Mm-hmm. Then there's this other thing of like, well, what else is possible? And what else is possible is you getting in touch with your essential self that kind of has the blueprint of like what you're doing here. So the exercise. I've been waiting for this one. The exercise Mm -hmm. to take it from like, okay, I'm here. Now I'm having these experiences. I like them. I don't like them. I want this. I'm mad that I want this. Why does somebody else have that? I'm envious. I'm jealous. After all, if we, if we sort of, play in those realms. And a lot of people spend their lifetime playing in those realms. The, uh, the ascension from that is the answer is so freaking simple. I just know that I'm going to say it and, and people are going to be like, well, what does that mean? And then complicate it, whatever. So I'm going to say it in like a couple different ways, but the answer is so simple. It's breathe, 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 stop, And breathe and bring your attention to your breath and know that you just contacted life force energy, prana, chi, the thing that animates you, the why you're here is breathe. But then it can't be that simple, can it? Right? Well, what if I don't force this to happen? I want this connection now. I have to effort this. If I don't, I can't just lay around and get what I want. I've got to go out into the world and uh, contribute a verse, right? Mm. Um, And uh, so breathe again. (laughs) Keep, it's do it. And that's the thing is when you sleep, you automatically do it, right? And there's the instinctual breathing and then the intentional breathing. But the intentional breathing does this very magical thing. And I define magic as taking the etheric, the unknown, and transmutating it into the physical, the known. So if you want to use this thing, this very powerful uh, element in our lives, breath, air, lung, combustion, to make a difference, to be able to switch gears, then you breathe and you get your ass on the mat. (laughs) You sit, you sit um, in meditation. And meditation is not just this cool, trending thing, right? And... um, while we westernize yoga with all our freaking yoga pants, thanks Lululemon and such, not, not such, whatever. <laughs> um, there is, there's an element of yoga just means union to, to be yoked, right? So having a practice, uh, having a time that you set aside to slow down and listen uh, to quiet the hurried mind will, will be how you do this. That's the how, the how. And last night for me, it was like, well, I feel like crap. This is not, this is not a good feeling to come home to this empty space, to this pile of laundry, to groceries that need to be bought and to not really have somebody that I can ask for help Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, and there's nothing fancy about this. It's very simple interaction, you know, of oftentimes we don't know we exist unless we're witnessed. And I felt like without a witness last night and I, except for, I was sort of watching myself and 
all of my misery. And then I realized, okay, well, I'm going to sleep first. <laughs> That's, that seems like the first thing to do is take a nap. And then after I woke up and my body was like, hey, that's enough for resting. I still had that density of feeling, that feeling of just like, I'm isolated, I'm isolated, I'm alone, I'm alone. And then I took to journaling and I started to like write it out. And I wrote out the feels. Mm. I wrote out, this is how I want to feel. I want to feel. So I made a little bit of a list of that. I said, I want to feel quality connection over quantity. I want to feel expansive within the boundaries of a relationship, a partnership. I want to feel uh, competent by being witnessed. You know, it's there's something really sweet about being told you're beautiful and being able to receive that versus being like, oh no, it's just the makeup. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and I, I went through this list of, I want to feel this. And I really want to give a shout out to Danielle Laporte, who wrote the book, The Desire Map, mm -hmm. who I think was one of the um, originators of having this come into pop culture of the idea of, we say we want the big house or the shoes or the whatever, but we want a sense of power. We want a sense of competency. We want to, we want to feel something, um, And so in writing that, I was like, oh, well, those are all available right now. <laughs> those are all available right now. So I share that to illustrate that in your brokenheartedness and in your sorrow, it might be the most dominant feeling that's happening right now. And it's okay, but you can choose love by just breathing, meditating, journaling, and taking that space to access the thing that we're most lonely for is your essential self. And then repeat. Rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. And I think Specific to this topic, the thing that I would like to offer the most is to be with the struggle, right? To be, to just, to just let it work you. Like when you go to the gym and lift weights, you tear your muscle to be with the struggle, to be with that, that I, that I hold that intense sense of like, I'm not getting this right, or I'm not, but whatever that is for you, it might be, I'm not pleasing enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm whatever, or whatever that thing is to be with the struggle, because through that, there's this thing that uh, I've, that has been named in the spiritual culture as essential self, mm -hmm. you know, the you that is watching the comings and goings, the thing that is always there, um, that is that is patiently waiting to find the moment to be fully expressed. And that just like brings like I can just feel the the depth of that emotion of just Here I am with limited understanding because my mind can conceptualize infinity. But can I ever really experience it? And we work and we toil and we struggle and we desire because all of that is unfolding this moment of the full expression, the full expression, the, the radiant, beautiful expression that creates movements and that changes worlds. I need another amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to lean into the, 
the sort of the sanctity of the energy that's coming through and acknowledge that while it's my voice and, and, uh, the words that are coming through me, I can really feel what I would say the presence of the Holy Spirit or, uh, you know, Shiva Shakti or any of that is, is here in this moment. And I invite everybody to just to take their moment to take a breath and touch into your essential self. And I offer so much gratitude for this opportunity to to be in this energy and to support the uh, flourishing of it in, in the world, one person at a time. So choose love. <laughs>